Jazakallah. Thank you, Dr. Zakir Naik. We now move on to the second part of the program, which is the question and answer session. For the purpose of the question and answer session, may we have slips of papers being sent over here so that we may pose these uh, questions, as well as those of you who are interested in asking questions directly to Dr. Zakir Naik, there are two mics that have been provided in the auditorium. You have one in the ladies' section, and sisters who are keen on asking questions to Dr. Zakir Naik may pose questions to him on the mic over there. And we have one over here, right in the front, next to the stage. And uh, members of the gents audience who wish to ask questions may also do so. Let me briefly tell you what should be the guidelines that we would like to observe during the question and answer session so that we derive maximum benefit. One person at a time would be allowed to ask a question. If you have more than one questions, please await your turn at the end of the queue so that when your chance comes, you can ask your second question. After you have asked a question, please do not go back to your seat. Remain standing at your position so that Dr. Zakir and I can address you while answering your question. May we have the questions over here so that we can begin soon, please? Please. Sister, may we have your first question? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. In an attempt to promote Islam, is it all right to quote from the translations of the Quran? And if so, how do we know which translations are authentic? The sister asked the question that while promoting Islam, giving the message of Islam, can we quote the translation of the glorious Quran? And if we have to do, then how do we know which is authentic? Sister, there are various translations available in the languages. As I told you, approximately 100 or a little bit more than 100. What do you have to do, sister? A person who is an expert in both the languages, Urdu, Urdu and Arabic, you have to ask the person who is well-versed in both the languages, which is a better translation. The best what I always say, that if every Muslim knows Arabic as a language himself, that's the best. So himself can judge what is right, what is wrong. He himself can get the message of the Quran directly and then propagate amongst the people. But since I know that 80% of the Muslim world doesn't know Arabic, what you can do is that you can ask the person who's an expert in that field, who knows that language, maybe Malayalam or maybe Tamil, whatever language it is, and Arabic, and see whether it's right or wrong. And those people are well versed in both the languages, they will be able to tell you which translation is correct. Or you can compare the various translations that you have. If there are more than one, if there are ten, you can compare and you'll find that majority of the places, they are common. In some places, there are different opinions. So when the place of different opinion arises, that time you can go and ask a person who is well versed in both the languages, which is more correct. And a person who has knowledge of the Sai Hadith also. Besides having knowledge of the Quran, many times the commentary of the Quran is given in Sai Hadith. So a person who is well versed with Quran and Sai Hadith, he will be in a better position to explain to you that which commentary is better and which translation is better. Hope that answers the question. We have received certain slips of questions over here. The first question that is posed to Dr. Zakir Naik is that the media always portrays Muslims to be very ruthless and barbaric. And one of the instances that they quote very often is uh, the slaughtering of animals. Uh, why do Muslims slaughter the animals in a ruthless manner by torturing it slowly and painfully killing it is a common question that a lot of non-Muslims writers portray in the media. How does one answer this onslaught? The best I the question, and it's a good question, that the media and non-Muslims they portray Islam as a ruthless religion, as a merciless religion, and the quote instant that why do Muslims when you all kill the animal, when you all eat the animal, you are sought in a particular fashion, so ruthlessly, you all torture him slowly and you make him die slowly and so painfully, why not directly in one shot, you know, one shatka finish, why are you all so ruthless? And one there was an argument going on between a Muslim and a Sikh. You know, Sikh is a person who comes mainly from Punjab, you know. They start from there, Sikh is a person who wears a turban, they are Sikhs. We have approximately 2% of Sikhs in India. So once a Muslim brother of ours and a Sikh was having a discussion. And the Sikh was saying, oh, you Muslims, you all are ruthless people. You all torture the animal painfully. Why don't just give one jhatka and finish the animal is dead? Why kill the animal so mercilessly? So our Muslim brother, he replied, that see, you Sikhs, you are a coward people, you are attacked from behind. Muslims, we are mard ka bacha, we are attacked from the front. This was a battle of wits. It's not the right answer, it's a battle of wits. He didn't know, so he said, oh, you are a coward people, attacking from behind. We are mard ka bacha, we are brave, courageous, we are attacked from the front. That's not the answer why the Muslims sought her. That he was using his hikmah. The reason that the Muslim Duzabi hired the Arabic word for the 
Islamic way of sacrifice, of slaughtering, is Zabiha. Is during Zabiha, there are certain conditions that the knife should be sharp and the cut should be quick and various conditions. And amongst them, the main is that you should take the name of Allah and you should even cut the windpipe and the vessels of the neck, the jugular veins and the arteries out here should cut. The reason that we cut the windpipe and the jugular veins and the vessels of the neck is because when we cut, we should see to it that we don't damage the spinal column. Only cutting the front part, the animal is yet alive. The heart is yet pumping. So when the animal is yet alive and the heart is yet pumping, the majority of the blood flows out of the body of the animal. Majority of the blood. The reason that we want the blood to flow out of the animal's body is because today science tells us that blood is a very good media of germ, bacteria and toxins. And if we have this blood along with the meat, there are high chances that you may get various diseases. So we Muslims, we are hygienic people. That is the reason when we slaughter, we slaughter in the Islamic fashion. And besides that, meat, which is slaughtered by the Islamic way of Zabiha, remains fresh for a longer time. Remains fresh for a longer time as compared to meat by chatka, directly with the one shot or by stunning or letting the blood remain. Because blood is a good media of German bacteria, the meat can get rotten very fast. So it remains fresh for a longer time. And besides that, if you analyze, life, it's a misconception that the animal feels pain. Because when we do zabi have any slaughter and we cut the vessels of the neck, the blood supply which goes to the nerve which is responsible for feeling of the pain, that blood supply is cut off. So the animal does not feel pain. The blood supply going to the nerve which is responsible for feeling of pain is severe. So the animal does not feel pain. I do know that the animal kicks and rithers, but the kicking and rithering is due to the gush of flow of blood. It is not due to pain. In fact, on the other hand, in stunning, when you hit the animal hard, the animal feels tremendous pain. Here it's a quick cut and the blood supply to the nerve going is severe and the animal does not feel pain. He dies after a few minutes, three, four minutes, but it's not torture to death. In stunning, very often the animal dies after five minutes, very often. Sometimes may die on the spot, but very often even that animal also shivers. But in the Zabia method, he does not feel pain. Even standing directly also if he dies, yet it is more inhuman than the Islamic method in which the blood flows out, German bacteria is this, the meat remains fresh for a longer time and the animal does not Maybe have the next question please. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I'm Junaida from Mangalore. Um, some Maulvis say that journalism is not a good profession for Muslims. They say it consists more, more of ghaybat, which Islam does not permit. But brother, when I'm unhappy to say that those are the one who does not, uh, those are the one who do, who do not forget to read the rumors page when they have the paper in their hand. The sister posed the question that some of the Maulvi say that journalism is not a good profession because it consists of ghaybat. And besides that, these are the same people who when read the newspaper, they read the newspaper of humor or rumors, whatever it is. So isn't these people are contradicting. Sister, journalism is of various types. Why do those Malvis read, whether they lead or not, I don't know, sisters. Whether the Malvis read rumor or don't read rumor, I'm not aware of that. You can have each individual Malvi is a different person, so you can't just blame all Malvis together. You can't paint all the people with the same brush. I don't know which Malvi you are referring to. But coming to the first part of the question, that some people say that journalism involves gibbat. Sister, journalism is of various types. You have general journalism, Yellow journalism where you simply malign people, you have journalism which is good, and you have to follow the basic guidance of the Quran which says in Surah Isra chapter 17, verse 81, Wakul Jal Hak Wazakal Batil, Inna Batil When truth is heard again, 